Well, good morning. My name's Dan Sperling, and uh, you see my credentials up there. Um, in terms of aviation, I don't have many credentials. I do fly 100,000 miles a year, but I don't do the piloting. <laughs> so that's about as close as I get. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you here about, kind of uh, in a sense relating to what Todd just talked about, but I, I'm going to focus, I, I see the glass a little more half full. I'm a kind of a half full kind of guy. And so I am going to talk about these three revolutions. And so many of you got, got a copy of the book. You know, hopefully you at least skimmed through it so you'll know a little bit what I'm going to talk about. And I'm, I come at this, and I come at this general topic of sustainability and transportation and the future primarily from an academic perspective. But about 11 years ago, I was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger to serve on the California Air Resources Board. And, you know, many of you might know it's a, many people say it's the most powerful agency in California. And I would note that those that say that don't usually mean it as a compliment. Uh, but we are responsible, in that role, we're responsible for, see, I have multiple hats on. This is one of my hats. Uh, in that role, I serve, uh, I oversee all of the air pollution and climate policies for California. So I've become not just, I've become not just an academic, but a regulator. And for many years, that created a lot of tension in me because as an academic, sticking to the data, being neutral and independent, when you're in a policymaker, a regulator, you have to make decisions, just like in business. And I've come to appreciate that, I've really come to appreciate the life of politicians, that they really are being asked to make choices and decisions across a large range of topics that they really have almost no expertise in. I, I joined the Air Resources Board, I thought, okay, I'm an expert on all things related to transportation, air pollution. This is going to be a piece of cake. And I found, and on the board, I was probably, was the most expert in those areas. And we come across many issues where I have no idea what the right, <laughs> right thing to do is. So I come to this with some humility um, and to this topic that you're concerned with as well with some humil humility. There's my boss, Mary Nichols, California Air Resources Board. Okay, and so with the book that you have, you know, let me give you a little context for it, and that is that it was an attempt to say, okay, what do we know? But now we have to use what we know, which is pretty limited, about to say something about the future. And that probably resonates with all of you because the future is uh, very uncertain. So, start out, I'll support, so I agree with a lot of things that Todd said. The first thing I'll agree with is we really have created a transportation system that's not sustainable. We've created this very car-centric transportation system, you know, at least the part that's down on the ground here, that is uh, very car-centric. Our cities are car-centric, our lifestyles. You know, you see the photo there below, at the bottom. I, I mean, that's kind of extraordinary when you look at it, you, you know, how many lanes there, that spaghetti web of freeways and, and freeway lanes. And that's what we've created. Uh, I do like to point out, setting the stage going forward, is that in this country we tend to say, you know, cars are, are sacred and, you know, don't take away my car. You know, I have a right to it, not just a privilege. And so this is to point out that there's a lot of vehicle travel we do that's not necessary, that in fact, if that person got out of that SUV and walked the dog, they'd be healthier, there'd be less pollution, uh, less cost, and less greenhouse gases and less energy use. So just a little bit on setting the stage here a little uh, some more is we've created you know, what I call this car-centric monoculture. And I call it a monoculture because cars have clear, clearly dominated. So Todd 
you know, is uh, car free. I actually declared I was going car free when I moved to Davis. And then my wife told me because of my role on the Air Resources Board, I had to walk the talk. And that meant not walking. <laughs> that meant buying an electric car because we, we re she says, you're making everyone else buy an electric car. The least you can do is drive one. So I have a hydrogen electric car just to be a little bit different. So, but we've created this monoculture, and <clears throat> it's a monoculture in the sense that transit, which has uh, great benefits and values, but really in North America and the United States, plays a very, very small role, except in dense cities. And in fact, you know, in terms of trips, it accounts for about 2% of our trips, 2 to 3% of our trips. In terms of passenger miles traveled, it's about 1%. So conventional transit as we know it is, is not the solution. And so as you see here, you know, it is extraordinary, as Todd said, the system we have is extraordinarily costly. <clears throat> we spend, in the United States, we spend over $100 billion a year on roads. We spend, in terms of the cars we own, it, we spend about, on average, a, a new car costs $8,500 a year to own and operate. You know, that's insurance and depreciation and so on. That's extraordinarily expensive. I mean, it adds up to over a trillion dollars a year we're spending uh, on our cars in the U.S. Uh, we use uh, over 70% of the oil is used for transportation, another half trillion dollars as well as greenhouse gases. About a third of the greenhouse gases come from uh, transportation. So up there you see my little star piggy bank, uh, in case you were wondering what that was, a, a piggy bank that's been starved. Okay, and so just to set the stage a little more in terms of, and it also motivates how much demand and, and how compelling is it to create a new mode of travel so this was Los Angeles. This was a, a screen on our car in Los Angeles. We were driving around. This is a, so you, you know on these maps, when it's red, it means bumper to bumper, completely congested. This is, a, this is Los Angeles. Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock. There's no particular crashes or special events. This is a normal Saturday afternoon, and almost every freeway is bumper to bumper. It's not working, is, you know, is the answer. So looking back a little more, something especially relevant to this crowd here is that what have we done in terms of improving our transportation system over the years? And we've seen a lot of important systems, tr innovations, transformations. And here's a list for on the, on the passenger side and on the freight side. But you look at the dates on it, we've seen essentially no system level innovation in over 50 years. It's kind of, you know, many of those years I was working in, the, in, in this area and I look back and I thought, I thought it was kind of interesting at the time, I look back now, it was so boring. Nothing happened. So yes, our cars are much higher quality, they're, they're safer and they're more comfortable, but they travel the same speed, they carry the same number of people, they run on gasoline, our roads are functionally the same, our transit is functionally the same as it's been for the last 50, 60 years. So now, we do have in transportation, all of a sudden, we have a lot of innovation and innovations that have the potential to truly be transformational. So we have the electric vehicles, and it provides a lot of environmental benefit, as, as Todd points out very correctly, is it doesn't solve our fundamental transportation issues, dealing with access and cost and, and, uh, and, and congestion, but it does go a long ways towards reducing our greenhouse gases and our pollution. But if we combine that with automation and what I call pooling, 
Now we're talking about something that really is transformational. So this transformation that we're talking about, where we're, we're creating electric, shared, automated vehicles, it's, it is going to happen. Certainly the automation and the electrification is going to happen. There's no doubt about it. And it's going to be disruptive. It's already been disruptive for taxis. Many taxi companies are going bankrupt and though in places where they have these medallions that they have to operate, the value of those has dropped precipitously. Transit has been uh, affected, not nearly as much as, tra as uh, taxis yet, but 32, 31 out of the 34 major metropolitan uh, transit or, uh, organizations in the U.S., you know, in terms of metropolitan areas, 31 of the 34 have lost ridership in the last few years, while at the same time we're putting more and more money into transit. And so, you know, transit's in trouble. So a little bit of it, you know, Uber and Lyft are part of it. They've got other, other challenges as well to go with it that explains what's happening in taxis, but ta I mean uh, transit. But transit's in big trouble in this country. And then you have the automobile industry, which has not been disrupted yet, but is going to be disrupted. And they know that every, every car company has a subsidiary or, or major division where they're trying out all these different new service models. They're going to, you know, do Uber, Lyft kind of things. They're going to, you know, they're investing in bike sharing. They're, they're investing in microtransit. Microtransit is where you have small, where you have vans or small buses that essentially operate like Uber and Lyft, but they have larger capacity. There's companies like Via and Chariot that you might have heard of. So anyway, you have all these coming in. Car companies are very worried because they see the future being very different. And they don't quite know what it's going to be. None of us really know what it's going to be. And, and they're trying to figure it out. Oil companies, of course, they're going to lose. Uh, they're, they're the most disrupted of all in the long term because we're basically saying their business model is unacceptable as we decarbonize. And that's not, you know, and then there's rental cars and there's insurance and parking and aftermarkets. All of these industries are going, are going to be disrupted in the, in the coming years. So as I talk about in the book, we're looking at a very different future. We're not quite sure exactly how it's going to play out, but it's very clear it can go in different directions. And so one of the directions that we lay out is the heaven scenario. And that is if these three revolutions happen together, we can create a transportation system that really is sustainable in ways that we couldn't even imagine even five or ten years ago. So we can imagine a transportation system which is much less expensive to the individuals, to users, much ex less expensive to government in terms of providing infrastructure, um, where it would create a lot more choices for people because now, because we have this car-centric system, there's a large percentage of our population, mobility disadvantaged, whether for economics or physical reasons, that don't have access to a car. And if you don't have access to a car, with a few exceptions, you know, living in some dense urban areas, uh, you're losing access to a lot of services and activities. So. There's lots of, there's, we can weave this scenario future which is very, very compelling and, and very attractive. But it also can go in the other direction. And that is that if these vehicles are, autom if we just take automation and superimpose it on what we have now, in other words, we have our own cars, we, we individually own them, we're going to see a tremendous increase in travel. And I'll have a graph, I'll get into that in a moment. So these vehicles are going to be disruptive, but they are going to happen. There's almost no question at this point. The technology is advancing very quickly, the automation technology, 
By the way, I call it automated vehicles, not autonomous, because autonomous is really um, is corrupting the English language. These vehicles are not going to be autonomous. They're going to be, to use another word, connected. These vehicles are going to be connected to each other. They're going to be connected to infrastructure. They're going to get all kinds of information. So they're automated and connected, but they're not going to be autonomous. In any case, um, they are inevitable, but how it plays out is uncertain. There is a lot of hype out there. Car companies are hyping it. The, all the high-tech companies are hyping it. Media is hyping it. And so it's not going to happen nearly as fast as you read in the newspapers, at least in any kind of commercial way. But it is going to happen. And probably it's good that it's going to take a little longer. You have episodes where the Uber car killed a pedestrian in Arizona uh, a few weeks ago. And things like that are going to slow it down. And it's probably a good thing because we do need to figure out how to do this well. And we want to do it safely. And we want to do it in a way that's in the public interest. And so one of the, you know, one of the considerations here, and it's, it's with respect to the av some of the aviation ideas we're talking about here, is that government, we've starved government for so long in this country. They don't, they're not well prepared for innovation. So as I said, in transportation, there's been so little innovation, so they didn't have to be creative and innovative because there wasn't much changing in their environment. And so we've got governments, city governments especially, that really don't have the resources, they don't have the creativity, they don't have the people to really be uh, anticipating and partnering with and integrating a lot of the innovations. And that's on the land side, and it's going to be the same thing on the, on the air side as well. So... Um, I want to emphasize the point. So the, the, actually, these words here come directly from the, the conclusion, the epilogue of the book. And I've come to believe these more and more uh, as I've gone along. And that is, pooling, I think, is the answer. It's the answer now for our transportation problems. And it's even more so the answer as we move towards an automated future. And and if we're thinking about climate change, if we're thinking about traffic congestion, if we're talking about social equity, really pooling. And what that means is today there are services like Lyft Line and Uber Pool, uh, as well as these microtransit companies that are pooling companies. They are providing that service. Um, but they're light, very lightly used so far. So what we need to do is somehow create the conditions to support that. So you're kind of getting the sense that, and I'm going to, as we go more into the aviation side of this is that I am a policy, I, you know, I started out as an engineer. I'm a fallen engineer, I guess. Uh, I, I've now, because of my time in Sacramento, working on policy for these years, I've really become focused on the policy side. How do we use policy to achieve what we think is, is in our larger interest? So here's one graph I want to show you about um, about the effect of automation. So this is a study being done some, by some of my colleagues at UC Davis and at UC Berkeley together. And what they've done is they've given chauffeurs to people, like full time for a period of time, to simulate the automation experience. And what these are the results they've found is that there's, on average, so these are early results, it hasn't been published yet because these are still early results, um, but what they found on average, 83% increase in vehicle miles traveled. And actually, you know, I look around this crowd, there's a lot of gray hair here, including mine, under here. <laughs> um, and older people, you know, we, as we get older, our eyesight's not so good, you know, we get a little more uncertain about driving at night. And so, it turns out older people actually increased their driving the most, you know, when they had a chauffeur. So it's just indicative that we are likely to see something like a 50 to 100 percent increase in vehicle use if we just impo give automated vehicles, you know, replace our conventional gasoline manually controlled 
cars with, with uh, automated vehicles. And so that's why pooling is so important, uh, looking to the future. And, and looking at it in a very positive way, and this also provides a baseline to be thinking about as we think about the uh, aviation options, urban aviation options, is it's going to be very cheap because now you're talking about vehicles that you're operating 100,000 miles a year in a, in a mobility service by a company. So now all the costs, so now when we drive our own our cars, we only use them 5% of the time, about 10 to 15,000 miles a year. So now we're talking about using them 12, 14 hours a day, 100,000 miles a year. So we spread the costs out you know, over those miles much more quickly, so you reduce the costs a lot in that way. There's no driver. And then if you put you know, two or three people in that vehicle, you're talking about a cost that's 15 to 20 cents a mile. Our cars today cost about 55 cents a mile to full, full cost to own and operate. We're bringing it down to like 15 cents. And you just think about, you know, going from here to San Francisco, that's, I don't know, what's that, 30 miles or so? So that would be, um, you know, four or five, five dollars to do that. I mean, that's a game changer. And that really is what we're talking about here. So just as a reality check, though, as we think about it, in terms of this idea of pooling, we've have, we have been enc encouraging carpooling for many years now. So that you look at the graph on the right, back in the late 70s, carpooling was about 20% of, of commute trips. And we thought, wow, this is great. Let's build carpool lanes and let's you know, really encourage to get that 20% up. Well, what's happened? We're down to 9%. <laughs> it went in exactly the other direction. So this is another example of the failures we've had in transportation is uh, it's had no effect and we've spent a huge amount of money on these carpool lanes. So the question becomes as we go forward, are people really going to be willing to share rides? Are they really going to be willing to give up their cars? And Obviously, many, you know, I see a few people in the audience shaking their head no. <laughs> uh, obviously, many people are going to be very reluctant to do so, you know, and there's a lot of good reasons, you know. You use your car, you carry your dog, your kids, your sporting equipment, you just throw your stuff in there. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people will want to hang on to it. But as I point out, is everyone has a price. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for that emphasis. <laughs> Everyone has a price. And so as we look forward here, um, the question is going to be, to what extent are we going to be using policy to encourage this, this set of services that really are in the public interest, not necessarily in the private interest, because if we look at Uber and Lyft, I'm a very avid user of Uber and Lyft. I love it. And I rarely use, I use the pooling service once in a while, more for professional, you know, experience, I have to confess. Um, but I use it all the time. And it's a huge benefit and value to me and, and probably most of the people in this room. But the result, but the reality is those Uber and Lyft services where they have one rider, that actually is resulting in more vehicle use and more energy use. And so it's, it's in our personal private interest, but it's not in the larger public interest. So the question is, uh, to what extent are we going to use policy to encourage more of the pooling and, and less of single occupant? And it's not just single occupant vehicle use, we're talking about zero occupant vehicle use. Because those automated cars, you're coming to a meeting like this, if you're going to be here a couple hours, you say, I don't want to pay that $3 an hour parking fee. I'll just have it drive around on the streets for a while and, and then I'll call it when I'm ready or I'll send it back home uh, or send somewhere. There's going to be a lot of zero occupant vehicle uh, use going on as well. So, so just to pull it into this discussion here, so I, want to, I think that the concept of the urban a aviation concept that, uh, that Brian is pitching I think is 
the most compelling, at least in terms of having a big impact. And that is the idea of having planes that are very small, very light, very efficient, and very quiet. And don't use much space, can be inserted into the urban area, potentially. And I think that's, you know, the Uber type air taxi, you know, okay, there's some, there'll be some demand for that. But it's not, it's going to be a very my, trivial um, part of our travel, it'll be for a few uh, rich people. So just some thoughts here. So on the, you know, we can use this as a discussion. We're going to have a little panel after our next uh, speaker is that to what extent will these changes that are happening in transportation, these three revolutions, will they affect the demand for a new type of air service? Uh, you know, because like the kind of thing that Dr. Seeley's talking about is something that goes, you know, 15 to 100 miles in urban service. So will there, how much demand, how will this, these new automated, pool, maybe pooled, maybe not, how will they affect the demand? Uh, you know, part of the question is, will this traffic congestion, which has gotten really horrendous in our major metropolitan areas, is that going to persist? And the answer is probably yes for a long time because these automated vehicles, it's going to take time before they're actually widely commercialized and especially the pooling uh, version of that. So, and then there's the land use, the, the nimbyism. I, I've become, you know, not in my backyard. I, I've, I'll put it here, you know, lay it out. I've, oh, that's N-I. <laughs> Um, I've become a YIMBY, <laughs> yes, in my backyard. So I will support those small little <laughs> parks, you know, for, uh, for small planes because we've, we've done such a bad job of providing housing and the high housing prices in California have so much to do with well, just not building housing and the nimbyism that goes on in this state. So, and then there's the equity issue. You know, Todd pointed this out a little bit. You know, what are the optics of, you know, rich people flying over, you know, these urban areas and their little planes and everyone else stuck and congested. So that'll be one of the issues, liability. So I am a policy guy now. So I put my policy hat on to think about what are some ways to support these kinds of ideas. So these are Cali mostly California ideas because we do a lot more policy in California. You know, some of you might think that's good, some think it's bad, um, but it's reality. So we have something called the low carbon fuel standard that is a policy to require the oil companies to reduce the carbon intensity of their fuels, which means they have to use, they use biofuels or they have to switch to selling electricity and so on. So it turns out that this policy is resulting in uh, electricity used in a vehicle being worth about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you s use electricity in these planes, you can get back probably 10, uh, right now you could get back 10 cents. It'll probably be going up a little, uh, maybe even a lot in the future. So basically the electricity consumption becomes uh, almost free. Um, then we have another law, uh, it's the Sustainable Communities Act, and it's intended to reduce pollution and greenhouse gases in our cities in California. So it's a relatively toothless law at this point, but there's a lot of efforts to you know, create some more incentives and disincentives, and it's, it is region specific, but it does make cities inclined to support uh, transportation options that are low carbon. So to the extent that we're talking about electric, these electric planes, they really might get support for this reason. And then we have a zero emission vehicle mandate in California in which uh, we require the car companies to switch, uh, uh, to sell electric vehicles, battery electric and fuel cell electric vehicles and, uh, and so, this is my last bullet item. And so, this is a credit that actually is worth a lot. So, Tesla cars, for instance, 
they get back about over $10,000 per car from the electricity they use because they sell those credits to the other car companies that are not selling electric cars. So again, this could be, it wouldn't be available now, but it could be in the future. So just laying it out that as, you, as we think about these transportation options of the future, um, and I know this used to be a real techie crowd, and now Brian's doing a good job of broadening it out, these are the kinds of things to be thinking about in terms of the incentives and, that can be used. So thank you very much. Uh,